910 Ministries podcast, No Trash, Just Truth, with hosts Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. At Proverbs 910 Ministries, we are dedicated to taking out the trash of false teaching and replacing it with biblical truth. Welcome back. Well, we had a short one week break and Chris and I are thrilled to be back. And Chris, I'm sure everyone joins me in being very happy to see you back. Yeah. Honestly, I just want to take a minute here and say thank you to everybody who has been praying for me and for my family and especially for my dad's salvation over these past few weeks. It's been a hard time. It's been a crazy couple of weeks and I just could feel uplifted in prayer. I am slowly getting my voice back. It's mostly there. But I just would ask if everyone would please continue to pray for my dad. Um, We went from finding out that he had cancer, which made him really start questioning end of life things. And he had a great conversation with their pastor. You know, he told him the gospel and it was only about a week and a half later that my mom unexpectedly passed away. And I have seen so much evidence of my father thinking through these end of life things. I've seen him say in front of some of my unsaved relatives, you know, you either go to heaven or hell immediately after death. I've seen him say things that I had not heard him say before and talk about things that he hadn't really talked about much before. Although he had heard the gospel and he had asked questions, it's clear that he's evidently thinking about it now. So please just keep him in your prayers. I thank you so much for praying for him all this time and for praying for me. And we still have a lot of hard stuff to go through, but um, the Lord has used it mightily. And we have seen, and Rose, you were at my mom's service. You saw how many times the gospel was shared, not only upstairs, which the pastor made a very clear, definitive, and even said it, distinction between it was a worship service upstairs and then downstairs was going to be about her. And Rose... Like I said, the gospel could not have been shared anymore, I don't think, upstairs and downstairs. So I've been pleased about that. I agree. I told your pastor it was the most beautiful memorial service I've ever seen, I've ever been to, because he did. He he talked about your mom in a wonderful way. He knew her personally, so you know he was able to give a little personal witness about her. But then he flipped it on its head and said, okay, but this is about Jesus. This is about our Savior And it's what Dottie, your mom, would have wanted. And it was just beautiful. He did. He gave the gospel in a beautiful way, woven in throughout the service. And then, like you said, Chris, downstairs at the luncheon, people shared great stories about your mom. I had the privilege of knowing your mom personally. I loved her. She was wonderful. She absolutely adored you. She made sure everyone knew she was your mom. And it was a wonderful, really wonderful thing about her. Um, Yeah. Oh, I I couldn't have been more pleased. Like I said, I have a lot of unsaved relatives, but I also have a lot of saved relatives and friends and they kept sharing the gospel over and over. Rose, it's kind of like getting hit over the head with a hammer (laughs) over and over. Like we say about studying scripture, that's how the gospel was shared that day. And I couldn't be more pleased. And I don't think mom could have been either. I don't think so either. We will keep praying for your dad and thank you, Lord for all the answered prayer we've seen so far, but it's good to have you back. So we do appreciate everyone's patience and prayers, and we're excited to be starting our series, Going for the Gold in 2023. For this series, we're going to be going through the book of 1 Corinthians. We're not going to be expositing it verse by verse. Instead, we decided to go through this book by pulling out themes of each chapter and digging into that theme. This book is so chock full of so much. If we exposited it verse by verse, it would take up all of 2023. Oh yeah, it definitely could. But let's start out by giving some background and intro material on this epistle. Paul wrote this epistle to the church in Corinth in 54 AD. He had stayed in Corinth three years prior to writing to the church. He stayed with Aquila and his wife Priscilla who were Jewish Christians who had fled Rome due to a decree by Emperor Claudius that expelled all the Jews from Rome. And we can read about the details of that in Acts 18, verses 1 through 17. So Paul is well acquainted with this church and the people there. 
Yeah, in all of Paul's letters, no matter how bad things went at a church he was writing to, he always found things to be positive about. He seems to always start his letters with thanksgiving to God for the people of the church that he's writing to. And 1 Corinthians is no different. There is one exception to that, and that's Galatians. But most of the time, Paul always finds things to be thankful for. But after his pleasant little greeting, he dives right into the problems that were plaguing the church in Corinth. And there were numerous ones. Yeah. Corinth was a port city, and that meant that people were constantly coming and going. And that might have contributed, or probably did contribute, to the morality problem that the Corinthians had. And some of it was secular immorality making its way into the church, if you can imagine that. And the church had other problems too. It was huge. That's not saying that's a problem, but there was chaos and division within the church because of cliques that had formed amongst its members. There was also rampant bad theology and false teaching. Imagine that too. And they had a problem with authority even to the point of challenging Paul's authority at times. There was a lack of humility and lack of consideration for each other. And to put it mildly, the church in Corinth was a hot mess. And that's how many, many churches are today. Yeah, we'll definitely see modern day churches having the same issues in the church in Corinth as we go through the book. So as a result of all this, Paul's letter to the church is pretty passionate. It's a pretty passionate letter he writes here. He uses strong words to correct and reprimand the Corinthians on a lot of issues that are in direct opposition of the gospel and in scripture. And his whole point in this is the hope of getting them to repent and get back to being under the authority of God's word and God's word only. As we say in the Bible blueprint, 1 Corinthians is probably the toughest of Paul's epistles to summarize because he deals with so many issues within this troubled church, or hot mess as you called it, Chris. He deals with issues like division within the church, sexual immorality, believers taking each other to court, marriage, living your life as you're called to, sacrificing food to idols, other forms of idolatry, head coverings, communion, spiritual gifts, unity loving each other, prophecy, speaking in tongues, worship, and resurrection, and I'm sure I didn't touch on them all. I think we're going to find that a lot of this, if not all of what Paul says, is going to be applicable to us and to the condition of the church today. Yeah, there was a lot. I mean, yeah. my head probably would have popped off trying to correct all that. But while this book is extremely difficult to summarize, it does have a theme. And that theme can be summed up in two questions. What does it mean to be wise? And what does it mean to be spiritual? And these are two really, really important questions. And we're going to be answering them in light of what Paul writes throughout the book. Godly wisdom is crucial for Christians to be able to live a godly life in a corrupt and evil world. It's crucial for them to navigate living in that world while remaining separate from it. And all the time, we're supposed to be witnessing and engaging believers. And that definitely calls for godly wisdom. I struggle with this a lot. Yeah, I struggle I with this a lot. I, I, mean, not, I don't agree that you struggle with it. I agree. <laughs> I struggle with it too. Well, you can agree that I do because I do. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's hard to know when to say something, when not to. You find yourself laughing at something you probably shouldn't be laughing at. And then you think, oh, this person's not saved. And here I am laughing like I'm an unbelief. I mean, it just gets to be messy. So we all need some help with this probably. And this wisdom is what helps us stand firm in our faith and in the truth of God, despite the opposition that we're going to face. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Like we said, Corinth was a bustling and busy port city in Greece. The Greeks were known for valuing education and intelligence over everything else. And the Corinthians were no different. In this epistle, Paul tells the people of the church that there is a vast difference between being smart and being wise. And boy, don't we see the stark difference of those two things today. Yep. Being smart as the Corinthians highly regarded is really of little value as Paul is going to show us. Anyone can get book knowledge. It's true today. There's a lot of smart people who 
are really extremely unwise. Wisdom is what we need and what we need to strive for. And true wisdom is wisdom that only comes through God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what enables us to live godly lives and sorting out the messiness that you talked about, Chris, and being able to live godly lives and make the right decisions about when it's okay to laugh and when it's not okay to laugh at something. The unbelieving world not only doesn't acknowledge this wisdom, they think it's foolishness. But for us as believers, it's the very manifestation of the power and love of God. As Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. The church in Corinth needed to stop thinking like the world and start thinking like Jesus. They needed godly wisdom. And that's exactly what Paul tries to teach them in this epistle. And then the second question Paul addresses is, what does it mean to be spiritual? And Rose, this is also crucial because of how wrong the world, and even many Christians, have gotten this, starting in Paul's time right up till today. Just like with not understanding the true definition of wisdom, many in the church in Corinth didn't understand the true definition of spiritual. We did an interview a few months ago with Doreen Virtue, where we clearly saw how corrupt spirituality has become. And well, Paul was dealing with the same thing in the church in Corinth. They were using worldly views of their time to define what spirituality was. And we're going to dive into this in depth in a later episode, but they falsely believed that the soul and the body were completely separate and that one did not affect the other. So while they gave their soul to Jesus, their body, they thought, was theirs to do with whatever they wanted. And it led to rampant sexual immorality in the church. Hmm. You know, confessing Jesus with your mouth, but grossly sinning with your actions. It does sound kind of familiar. Just a bit. Uh, yeah, and as we'll see when we get to it, Paul has really strong admonishments about it. Yeah. So let's start by diving into chapter one. And like we said, we aren't going to exposit verse by verse, but we want to note that in the greeting, Paul says this epistle is from him, a chosen apostle by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes. Paul makes a habit of mentioning people who are with him when he's writing. We see it in most of his letters and epistles. And it's always helpful to know who these people are when we can know it. So who was Sosthenes? Well, we might find the answer back in Acts chapter 18. Along with telling us about Priscilla and Aquila, chapter 18 tells about Paul's visit to Corinth. While he was there, the ruler of the synagogue, Crispus, became a Christian. And then a few verses later, Sosthenes is mentioned as the leader of the synagogue, so we can assume that Crispus left his position as leader of the synagogue after following Jesus and becoming a Christian, and that Sosthenes took over as the leader. Right, and the Jews in the synagogue united and launched an attack on Paul, saying that he taught people to worship God contrary to the law. So they bring him in front of the Roman who's in charge, named Gallio. But Gallio sees that this dispute is just about their religion and not about a real crime. So he doesn't really care. And he tells them to handle it themselves. And then something strange happens. Acts 18 verse 17 says, And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. And that's the end of the verse. Now, we're not 100% sure that the Sosthenes from Acts 18 that you just read, Chris, and the Sosthenes that Paul mentions in his intro in 1 Corinthians is one and the same man. Most scholars believe it is the same man. We also aren't completely sure why the people decided to seize and beat Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, in Acts 18. It makes it, no sense. It doesn't really make sense. It could have been that they thought their failure to prosecute Paul was his failure, and they were just really ticked about it. Or it could be that since the previous synagogue ruler had left and become a Christian, maybe they suspected Sosthenes of being either a Christian sympathizer or fraternizing in some way with Paul. 
either way, if this is the same Sosthenes from 1 Corinthians, and like we said, most scholars believe it's the same man, the fact that Sosthenes had gone from synagogue leader and leader of an attack against Paul to being called a brother and being with Paul while he's writing this letter would certainly have been a strong testimony of the gospel to the church in Corinth. It really shows the transforming power of the gospel. If this is the same guy, his story has a similar ring to it that Paul's does. So while we can't say with 100% certainty that the two Sosthenes are the same, what we can say about Paul mentioning Sosthenes the way he does in 1 Corinthians suggests that either Sosthenes is in total agreement with everything that Paul says in the letter or that Sosthenes was the scribe that Paul used to write his words out. In other words, Sosthenes wrote Paul's words. I, I think everything that we said gives lends credence to it being the same Sosthenes, but we're not sure. The church in Corinth would have known who Sosthenes was. After Paul gives thanks for the Corinthian church, he launches into an appeal to stop the divisions within the church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and same judgment. That's the end of the verse. There were issues with the people of the church only following certain teachers. Some in the church said they would only follow Paul, while others said that they would only follow Apollos. Others would only follow Peter, and some would say that they wouldn't follow any of them, only Christ. Paul explains to them that Christ is the one we all follow. He's our Lord and Savior. However, there are those who have been called to teach about Christ, and if they are teaching truth, there's no reason for division. Paul, Apollos, even Peter weren't Jesus. They were merely pointing the people to him. Chris, I think we need to spend some time on Paul saying that there should be no division in the church because it's a concept that's been hijacked, misused, corrupted, and exploited for evil. We see all the time people saying, they say it to us, stop criticizing brothers and sisters in the faith and other churches. Stop calling what you call false teachers out because you're causing a division in the church. And let me tell you, Satan and the unbelieving world are taking full advantage of the confusion and misinterpretation of Paul's words. We're going to see that. So first and foremost, we need to understand what Paul is saying here. The church was divided over following Paul, Apollos, Peter, and Jesus. Paul, Apollos, and Peter were all solid biblical teachers teaching the truth of God's word. It's not like you're going to go wrong being under any of their teaching. It would be like being divided today between following the teachings of John MacArthur, Vody Bauckham, or Alistair Begg. Yeah, they weren't choosing between Beth Moore and Paul Washer. <laughs> I mean, that's a no-brainer, at least for us. Paul's not talking about false teachers in this passage at all. Paul's addressing the church in Corinth as believers. He's saying believers need to be united, no divisions on the essential things of scripture. Paul, Apollos, and Peter were giving the same message. They were preaching truth, but still Paul's telling them that these are just men. Jesus needs to be the standard. We are to only follow Jesus and only look to scripture for our authority. God has graciously given us gifted teachers, preachers, and theologians that can help us better understand what the text says, He's given us those who can show us how the Bible is one story seamlessly woven together that all points to Jesus, and we need that. Paul was telling them, be willing to listen and learn from godly teachers, but at the end of the day, only follow Jesus. Be united and undivided on that. And of course, that means that we put everything we hear up against scripture and what Jesus taught. As Got Question says, and I'm quoting them, Paul is setting up Christ as the standard for every thought and judgment. As every person conforms to Christ, they will come into alignment with each other. Differences of opinion will be secondary to fundamental agreement 
and brotherhood through Christ. When Christians set up mere human beings as their standard, division is always the result. And that's the end of their quote. That's absolutely right. And that's exactly what was happening in the church in Corinth. Because they were holding up humans as their supreme leaders and as their standards, there were quarrels. We love John MacArthur and we love Vody Bauckham and we love Alice DeBeg and Paul Washer. We love sitting under their teaching. We love listening to their teaching. We listen to them. We read them. And, you know, as everybody should know by now, we quote them a lot. But they are just messengers of God's word. If they suddenly said something contrary to scripture or started teaching false truths, we would drop them in a hot minute because ultimately our loyalty is to Jesus and the integrity of God's word. Amen to that. But this hasn't been the case in many in the church throughout history. Many wolves, false teachers, have gathered followings of professing Christians and caused division and quarreling in the church. In fact, sadly, you only need to look at all the denominations and the array of statements of beliefs from churches today to see their diabolical plan has been effective. At least in the visible church, it has been effective. That's a good point. But maybe we should take a minute and define what you mean there, Rose, by visible church. The visible church is those who profess to be Christians. In contrast, The invisible church are those who are actually Christians. They've been regenerated and have come to a saving knowledge of Christ. So everyone in the invisible church is part of the visible church, but not everyone in the visible church is part of the invisible church. In other words, we sit in church with people in a group and some are tares and some are wheat. And this has caused problems forever throughout history in the church. People have criticized Christianity, especially Protestantism, because of the many different teachings and beliefs. And from the outside, it can look confusing and like we're a hot mess, just like the church in Corinth. But Jesus has promised to protect his bride, meaning the invisible church, those who are truly believers. He says in John 6, 35 to 40, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Chris, I think we should divert a little bit here because I think it's important to see the difference between the invisible church and the visible church and to better understand what Paul is saying when he says there should be no division in the church. And we can see how people get it so wrong. If we scroll through some church history, I think it'll help us see how the visible church has gotten it wrong horribly in history. And I think it will help us see the road that led us to where we are now. All the different denominations, different beliefs amongst churches professing to be Christians. And you can't possibly keep them all straight. There's so many. That's not even mentioning those that aren't even under a denomination. And that's why you need to know scripture. That's exactly why you need to know scripture. And you need to make sure you're part of the invisible church. Yeah. We talked about apologetics a couple weeks ago. and. That plays into this. We want to be able to answer questions like, is there ever a time that there should be division in the church? When people come to us and say, how can we believe the Protestant church is any good when it's so divided? We need to be able to answer it. Oh, is there? See that all, I see that all the time. People we ask see, that all the time. We do. We see it all the time. And they say, well, the Catholic church is united. The Protestant church isn't, which isn't exactly true. But we need to be able to address those questions. If there is a division in the church, is increasing that divide going against Paul's words here? How can we attain godly wisdom to help in this? And what should it look like for the church to be united and spiritual? Chris, let's start with a known strategy of politics, war, and anyone looking to get control of people. And that's that the way you control people is to divide them. 
a united people is almost impossible to gain control of. Divide and conquer. That was a phrase coined by Julius Caesar over 2,300 years ago, but in practicality, it's been practiced long before he ever said it. Way back in the Old Testament, this tactic was exactly how the pagan nations that surrounded the Israelites in the promised land got to the Israelites and caused them to sin. It's why Assyria and Babylon, when they overthrew Israel and Judah, took some Israelites back to Assyria and Babylon and inserted their own people with the Israelites that they left in Israel and Judah. It makes perfect sense. Divide and conquer. It just makes perfect sense. And we see this tactic playing out right now here in the United States, as you know, Rose, and maybe globally, leaders want people divided because they're easier to control that way. It's what's behind all the critical race theory stuff. The left wants everything to be seen through the lens of race so that we're divided by our skin color. And they even use it as a bolstering, you know, gay marriage thing because you're racist if you don't believe in gay marriage, no matter what skin color you you have. And that you know makes no sense, but it makes sense, no sense is not a criteria. <laughs> no. And they've tried to divide us by who took the COVID vaccine and who did not. They used our political party affiliation to divide us. Ten years ago, we didn't even know which party most people aligned with. And now it's so polarized that being a Republican or Democrat predetermines who you are. And, of course, they use our stand on abortion to divide us. If you're not completely pro-choice and endorse a woman's right to kill her baby, even if it's already born, you are a racist because you hate women. It's all meant to keep us divided so that we can be controlled. There is absolutely nothing new under the sun. What we're seeing right now is no different, and it's been the case throughout all of history. Satan and the unbelieving world wants Christians and the church divided because undivided, we're a powerhouse. That's right. As Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, Two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's the end of the scripture. Nothing gives a stronger message to the watching world or is a better witness than Christians standing firm and united together in the truth of God. And of course, God knew this, of course. He knew that the key to his people standing firm in his truth was unity within the body, an undivided church. In fact, the times the church has been the strongest is when there is unity within the church and division from the world. And that's exactly what the Bible stresses from Genesis to Revelation. The church and God's people need to live in the world, but not be of the world. And that's probably why the times the church has been at its least effectiveness and weakest spiritually is when it has been divided within and united with the world. And Chris, as you know, this is a really complex issue because Paul and scripture are talking about the true church, true believers, true followers of Jesus Christ, the invisible church. That is the church that is not to be divided. Exactly. But Paul and Jesus knew that those who show up to a building each week are not necessarily part of the true church. Just like standing in a garage doesn't make you a car, sitting in the church doesn't make you part of the invisible church. It doesn't make you a Christian. We're warned over and over and over about those who will infiltrate the church and try to destroy it. Remember, divide and conquer. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15 to 20, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. And Paul reinforces this teaching in Acts 20. 28 to 31, where he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, 
which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And that's the end of Paul's words. Peter, John, and Jude also warn against false and corrupt teaching that would infiltrate the church, would test the church, and would cause division. And guess what? It did. It certainly did. Throughout the first century and all the way up until the third century, Christians were persecuted under the Roman government. They were accused of burning down the capital city, and it was actually Emperor Nero who did it. They were accused of being cannibals because in the communion celebration, we repeat Jesus's words to eat for this is his body. And they were even accused of being atheists because they did not believe in multiple gods. And we see this atheism accusation play out in the third century under Emperor Diocletian. He ordered Christians arrested and killed, not because of their belief in Jesus Christ and the gospel, but because of the exclusivity of that. They denied that there were any other gods other than the one true God. Diocletian thought that his little g gods helped him get into power, and in return, he and the people had to worship those little g gods. If Christians in the church at that time had just compromised and said that there were other ways to get to heaven besides Jesus and that there were other gods besides the one true God, they wouldn't have been persecuted. Yeah. And Chris, that's a great example of an essential truth that believers in the church cannot be divided on and must be of one mind, as Paul says. Paul would have told the church in the third century the exact same thing he told the church in Corinth. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. That's the end of Paul's words. The church needed and needs to present a united front strengthening and encouraging each other as they stand firm in the essential truths of God's word. And those essential truths for what you're talking about, Chris, is that there's only one God, one Savior, and one way to heaven. They needed to be united in the truth of the gospel. And while there were certainly some individuals who did compromise that truth and possibly left the church and Christianity to save their life, the church overall remained undivided and strong. Many of those people were martyred, like twins, Marcus and Marcellianus, who were natives of Rome and of noble descent. Their parents were heathens, but their tutors brought them up as Christians. As a result of their faith, their parents and their whole family ended up becoming Christian. They were martyred by being tied to posts and having their feet pierced with nails. After remaining in that situation for a day and a night, They were ultimately killed by lances being thrust through their bodies. Besides their families coming to faith, their jailer and his wife were also converted. So the gospel spread. That's right. It did spread. And I'll give another example. In the year 286, there was a legion of 6,666 soldiers who were all Christians. They were excellent soldiers. But when their commander... Maximian ordered that all the military offer a general sacrifice and to take an oath of allegiance and swear to assist in destroying Christianity in Gaul, every single one of them refused. This got Maximian so angry, he ordered every 10th man from the legion to be selected and killed by the sword. So 666 of them. Soldiers from other regiments carried out the order, and still, those who remained, the 6,000 who remained, refused to take part in the sacrifice or the oath. So a second decimation took place. And again, every 10th man of those living were put to death. So another 600. Even after this second round of killings, it had no effect on the soldiers. Those remaining, the 5,400, still refused. By the advice of their officers, they appealed to the emperor. 
But rather than receive sympathy, the emperor was so enraged by their perseverance and unanimity, he commanded that the whole legion be put to death by the other troops. Every one of them was put to death by the sword, by their own military. Their comrades in the military killed them. Yeah, it's awful. Now, you would think these and so many other killings would have a detrimental effect on the church and that more people would leave it as a result. But it was the exact opposite. Persecution has a way of weeding out the fake or lukewarm Christians and strengthening the true Christians, the invisible church. The gospel was spreading quickly and mightily, and the church was growing at a rapid rate. Those who came to faith in Jesus and joined the church did so, knowing it's going to probably cost them their lives. That's right. And the result of that was a biblically sound and passionate church united with each other. The world hated them, so they had each other. They were devoted to Christ and to scripture. The church needed to be undivided and stand strong in God's word because it was their only hope. And it was a hope that was worth dying for. And because the church was so marginalized and hated, there weren't many accounts in history at this time of wolves trying to infiltrate it. There were surely some, but since there wasn't anything to be personally gained by being part of the church, in fact, it came at a great cost to do so, those who weren't truly devoted to Jesus weren't really interested in being a part of it. But this was all going to change in the year 312 when Christians went from being persecuted by the emperor to being championed by the emperor and becoming a political force. That's right. Constantine came to power in 306. His mother, Helen, was supposedly a Christian. Perhaps that's what made him once comment that he was awestruck at how courageous Christians were in the face of persecution and martyrdom. He couldn't believe how they refused to compromise their beliefs. So unlike past Roman emperors, he had an admiration for Christians. In the year 312, during the Battle of Milvian Bridge, Constantine claimed that he had a vision of a cross. He said this vision showed him that the God of Christianity was going to give him victory in the battle. And he did get victory in that battle. Constantine claims that it was at this battle that he became a Christian. As a result, Christianity went from being persecuted and outlawed to being the official religion of the Roman Empire. And that turned a lot of things on its head. Those who didn't claim to be Christian were now the ones being ostracized and persecuted. Yeah, once Constantine became a champion for Christianity, it strengthened the finances and the power of the church. The church went from being marginalized and hated to being a financial and political powerhouse. Now, we might think that's good news, but it was actually the worst thing that could have happened to the church and to the Christian faith. The Bishop of Rome, which is another name for the Pope, became a monarch over the entire church. It wasn't Jesus anymore. It was the Pope. He was second only to the emperor as far as power, political power, I mean, goes. Many people claimed to be a Christian because it was politically advantageous. Those go who figure. were- Yeah, go figure. That doesn't happen today. <laughs> Those who were greedy for power did what they had to to assume leadership positions in the church. The papacy and the whole church system became corrupt. It was no longer about preaching the gospel and discipling people for Christ. It was about gaining wealth, prestige, and power. Like you said, Chris, sound familiar? It should sound familiar to you because this is what the Christian nationalist movement, which we did two episodes on a while back, or any other movement that strives for a Christian theocracy, or the term that we're hearing a ton about today, theonomy, would drive us towards again. We said this many times, I'm just going to say it again. Old Testament Israel was God's country. They were his chosen nation. They were chosen by him to play a role that no other nation was or is called to. There is no Christian nation today. There's no chosen nation today. You hear this all the time about the United States. It's supposed to be a Christian nation. No, it's not. 
you have to realize even within that nation, not all of them were saved. They were a chosen nation, like I said, to play a role at that time. Making the United States or any other geographical country a Christian country would essentially be the same thing that Constantine did. The church is who God has given the responsibility of administering the word and the sacraments to, not the government. We don't want a national church where the government is telling us how to worship. Now, I say that. And that doesn't mean that we don't want Christianity reflected in our laws because there is no morality without God because he's the lawgiver. And we should strive for godly laws to be put in place because they're just and they're righteous. We should want abortion made illegal because it's murder. We should want theft outlawed. We should want laws that prohibit exorbitant taxation or the state taking away private property for redistribution. All of those things are wrong. And God is the one who gave us government. He gave us government for earthly justice and protection. He gave us government to act on behalf of the good of all people and to give us an ordered and a peaceful social space. And I want to quote something here from the ESV study Bible online. And this was from an article written by a man named Michael O. And here's his quote. Ordered and just social spheres should be forums for obedience to the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. It is right to desire and seek religious freedom as Christians. However, civil governments should neither compel allegiance to nor forbid the practice of any particular religion, whether Christianity or any other faith. Jesus makes a clear distinction between spiritual and political authority. He gets that from Matthew 22, verse 21, and John 18, verse 36. This is the rest of the quote. To be sure, the church benefited from the legalization of Christianity under Constantine by the Edict of Milan in 313. Arguably, however, the church also lost some of its vitality when the lines between spiritual and political responsibilities became blurred. And that's the end of the quote. And I'm going to tell you why we mention this here, because this is a very hot topic in reformed circles right now. Theonomy and postmillennialism is a huge topic, and you're probably going to be hearing it more and more. And as we've seen from history, state mandated Christianity looks good on the outside, and it may seem very tempting in light of all of the evil that we see in our society today. But with it comes, with Christianity being the state government, it brings greed, it brings corruption into the church, and it leads to the church being complicit in persecuting or at least ostracizing those who don't profess to be Christians. And there are reformed people who are promoting this very type of thing. It doesn't do much for our witness and the spread of the gospel. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think a couple important points you made, Chris, was one, God used the nation of Israel for a reason. He delivered them all from slavery in Egypt. However, not all were saved. Only a remnant yep. were saved. Yep. And the other important point is if you want to know what Christianity as the state religion looks like, look at China. They have a state church. Russia had a state church. Germany had a state church. And you know what? They were all rotten. They were all corrupt Never turned that good. and evil. We, we should want Christian, we should want our laws to reflect Christianity, but it can't become the state religion. If you mix right. the church and state together, it's always bad. That's right. Because like Paul said, you're following the leadership of a person, not of Christ. Yep. It leads to heresy in the church. So we do have the advantage of being able to look back on history and see the consequences of these bad decisions made by the church. Even after supposedly becoming a Christian, Constantine killed his son and wife because it was rumored that they were having an affair. I don't know if they were mother and son, if they were actually related that way or if it was from a previous marriage. And we don't know if they were actually having an affair. We just know Constantine killed them because it was rumored that they were. Later, when he was getting close to death, 
He wanted to die sinless and he wanted a guarantee that he was going to heaven. Now, you would think that the Pope at that time, who was Julius I, would have come, read him scripture that has assurance of salvation for true believers. You think he would have told him, you know, repent of your sins now, ask forgiveness, preach the gospel to him, make sure he was putting his faith in Jesus. But nope, he didn't do any of that, Chris. Instead, Constantine was told by the Pope, who was the leader of the church, that if he just got baptized, that would assure him his salvation. Like I said, it leads to heresy in the church. Yeah. It's not good. Not good. And this belief called the doctrine of baptismal regeneration is still held by the Catholic Church today. In summary, Constantine is credited for making Christianity the main religion of Europe and the West. It is said that without Constantine, Christianity would have remained a small, politically powerless sect and not the powerhouse that it became. But you have to ask, is that a good thing? Well, not when you look at history. And if you go back and listen to those two episodes on Christian nationalism, you'll see how in the United States, those two things starting to mix together in the last 50 or 60 years has led us straight to where we are now. Even after the fall of the Roman Empire, the church retained power. And by then the church had become to be known the Catholic church, meaning universal. The vast majority of the population identified themselves as Catholic and part of the Catholic church. Popes became more powerful, more wealthy, more corrupt. When Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne as Roman emperor in 800, he established the precedent that in Western Europe, no man would be emperor without being crowned by a pope. In 1096, Pope Urban II launched the Crusades. That was a series of wars that lasted 200 years in total, and it was aimed at taking back Jerusalem and the Holy Land back from Muslim control, which it was under at the time. According to worldhistory.org, this wasn't some righteous campaign to regain the land, you know, the Holy Land and the Promised Land. Pope Urban II was, and I'm quoting them, motivated by a desire to strengthen the papacy and milk the prestige to become the undisputed head of the whole Christian church, including the Orthodox East. Taking back the holy city of Jerusalem and such sites as the Holy Sepulchre, considered the tomb of Jesus Christ, after four centuries of Muslim control would be a real coup. Consequently, the Pope issued a papal legate and set in motion a preaching campaign across Europe, which appealed for Western nobles and knights to sharpen their swords, suit up, and get themselves over to the Holy Land to defend Christendom's most precious sites and any Christians there in danger. And that's the end of the quote. So he sounded noble, but there was nothing noble about what they were doing. No. And the wars ended around 1290. There are no accurate estimates of the death toll, but scholars put it anywhere from 1 million people to 9 million people. During this time, there were some solid Christians who rose up against the corruption of the Catholic Church. People like John Huss, who openly taught against what the church was teaching and tried to bring people back to scripture. And John Wycliffe, who openly preached that everyone, even the Pope and church leadership, needed to put themselves under the authority of scripture. Both Huss and Wycliffe were executed on order of the Pope for their dissension. So Huss and Wycliffe and many others saw the church was no longer acting in a manner befitting the true bride of Christ, and they called them out on it. They weren't causing division. They weren't looking to divide the church. They were looking to reform it and bring those people to repentance. Exactly. And that was originally the same case for the Reformation. By the time the 1500s rolled around, as Ligonier Ministries puts it, the church's theology was rotten to the core. Honestly, the church's practices were no better than what the mafia does. With the mafia, they force you to pay what they call protection money. It's supposed to ensure that they'll protect your business. But the truth is that the only thing you need protection from is the mafia. 
Well, the church was exactly the same at that time. They sold you what was called indulgences. They said it was grace from the extra store of grace. It was protection from hell and insurance that you would go to heaven when you die. But what you really needed protection from was the church and their satanic teaching. As Martin Luther said, indulgences are the most pernicious because they induce complacency and thereby imperil salvation. Those persons are damned who think that letters of indulgence make them certain of salvation. God works by contraries so that a man feels himself to be lost in the very moment when he's on the point of being saved. Yeah, and it is the same here as we talked about with Huss and Wycliffe, because Luther wasn't looking to divide the church. He's trying to correct it. He was looking to reform it and bring it back under the authority of Christ and the Bible. Others joined in with Luther. Maybe some of you didn't know this, but Luther, Zwingli, Busser, and others were part of the Catholic Church. They were monks, priests, friars. Even John Calvin was training to be a priest. They never wanted the church to be divided. Like we said earlier, they wanted it to be reformed. But there came a point where reform in the Catholic Church was impossible, and the theology and the teaching was so antithetical to Scripture that there had to be a division. So they split, and the Protestant Church was born. And we don't have time to go through how each denomination was formed. But what we can say is that the Reformer Fathers were all united on the essentials of Scripture. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, they were united in the same mind and the same judgment. Yeah, and those essentials became the five solas. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola Christus, in Christ alone. Sola gratia, through grace alone. Sola della gloria, to the glory of God alone. And sola scriptura, scripture alone as the authority. Now, they did differ on pedo and credo baptism, meaning infant and believer's baptism, and their view of exactly what communion was, whether Jesus was physically present in it, spiritually present, or if it was just commemorating what Jesus had done. And there were debates and arguments and split-offs. And that's really sad because the result is sinful man running the church. But as we said, on the essentials, there was no division. That's right. Over the last 800 years, the church has gone through some really tumultuous times, again, due to sinful man and wolves infiltrating the church. But there was always a core of biblical believers, the invisible church, that has withstood persecution, corruption, and downright evil in the church and fought back against it in the name of Jesus. And these brave souls who took on corruption in the church, like Huss and Luther and Calvin and Spurgeon and Macon, and so many others always found a following of like-minded Christians. Jesus has been and will continue to protect his church until he comes back. Yeah, amen to that. So what does all this have to do with Paul's words in 1 Corinthians about there being no division in the church? Well, Chris, as with everything, understanding and following Paul's words requires wisdom. That's why the theme of this whole letter is what does it mean to be wise and what does it mean to be spiritual? Both of these adjectives have been corrupted by the world, but being wise means having wisdom that only comes from God, from knowing God's word, from knowing God, and from living it out. As James says in James 3.17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits impartial and sincere. That's the end of the scripture. Being spiritual means seeing things in light of the soul instead of the material or physical. In other words, being eternally minded. And as Jesus says in John 3, 5 to 8, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I have said to you, you must be born again. Okay, so we've thrown a lot of stuff out there today. We want to know how does this help us today? Well, Rose, I think right now we're seeing a repeat of history 
where in many churches, the theology is rotten to the core, but also like throughout history, Jesus is protecting his invisible church and his people who are standing firm in God's word and in their faith. But we need wisdom and we need to be eternally minded. If we're attending a church that's preaching a social justice message over the gospel or putting women or homosexuals in the pulpit or preaching moral life lessons, readers digest sermons, as I'd call them, instead of scripture or saying anything other than Jesus can save, then we need to get away from it. We need to run away from it. While there may be true Christians in that church, that church is not part of the invisible church. Of course, God could redeem it at some point, and they could, all who are sitting in the pews, come to repentance and true faith, but you need to be under a biblical church right now. Absolutely. Yeah, that kind of division, there's absolutely nothing wrong with. Now, and if you are part of a biblical church, work to keep it united. Don't let divisions creep up over non-essential things. Remember, Satan and the unbelieving world wants us divided, divide and conquer. But a church united in Christ and the word of God will not be conquered. In fact, if history is an indicator, and we've seen that it is, their witness, their courage, and their resolve will make the gospel spread like wildfire. So instead of getting discouraged at the state of things right now, Look at it as an opportunity. Yeah, we are at a crossroads. Like during the time of Diocletian, if Christians would just acquiesce and accept that Jesus accepts everyone and that some of the sin listed in the Bible has either been misunderstood or is no longer applicable, then we would get along just fine with the world. And many churches have taken that road and they're applauded by the world. But getting along and being lauded by the world was never and should never have been the goal of the church. And it's not the goal of God for his people. As Paul says later in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 18 to 21, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? Well, God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. And we're going to talk more about that next week. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Friends, protect Jesus's true bride. Stay united. Stay away from counterfeit brides. Protect the church. Get into a church that is solid on the essentials of the Bible and where the gospel is being preached and scripture is being exposited. Then work to keep divisions from creeping in. And above all, make sure your church is united in following the only teacher who will never lead us astray. And of course, that's Jesus. There are over 2.2 billion people in the world who identify themselves as a Christian. But the truth is, the number of the real followers of Christ, the invisible church, is much, much smaller. For those of us who have received the gift of grace and are counted in that small number, let's not take that gift or our responsibility to the bride of Christ lightly. Amen to that. Have a blessed day, everybody. 